Good morning, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to you all to our worship from St. Andrew's with Castlegate United Reformed Church in Nottingham for Sunday, the 18th of April. If you wish, please join together in those parts that are in bold type. Let us worship God together. Some verses from the first epistle of John. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We sing together our first hymn, God is love, his the care. Come before our God in a time of prayer and reflection. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the eternal message of Easter, that there is nothing in this world or the next that can ever separate us from your love. We praise you for the assurance that life is never meaningless, that love can never be blotted out, and that faith is never futile. We praise you that death is not the end, but a new beginning, a gateway into the untold blessings that you have in store for us. So we offer you our worship and our praise, and we ask that you will help us to live each and every day in the light of your Easter triumph. Eternal God, you call us to walk in the light, yet so often we walk instead in shadow. We know that we should love one another, that we should put the needs of others before our own, denying ourselves in order to give service. But sometimes the pull of self-interest is hard to resist. We know 
that we should put everything aside that destroys relationships, everything that comes between us and our neighbor, everything that comes between us and you. But sometimes old habits are hard to overcome. We know that we should put faith into action, not just talking about love, but expressing it through deeds. Not just speaking of your kingdom, but working diligently to bring it closer. But sometimes we fail to put into practice that for which we pray. Instead of shining as a lamp on a hill, we hide our light under a bowl in shame and in fear. We rejoice that on the day of resurrection a new kingdom dawned, a kingdom where light overcomes darkness and darkness can never conquer it. We ask for your forgiveness and we claim your new start for ourselves. Shine in our hearts now, we pray, and may the brightness of your love flood our hearts and souls. We sum up all our prayers as we say together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our first and Old Testament reading comes from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 6, and reading verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to him, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Thank you very much indeed. When I was a young lad, one of the great thrills for me on a Sunday morning was not to go to church with my parents, but instead to go to church with my grandfather. My grandfather was a congregational minister. and When I was a young lad, grandfather often took services in the small village churches around Reigate and Dorking in Surrey. And it was a great thrill for me to be invited to go out with him and listen to one of his services. We would go out in his old Morris Minor, and the arms, the indicator arms on the side of the car did not work, so it was my, my job to put my arms out of the windows at the back to indicate to cars behind which direction we were turning. But one of the great thrills for me about going out with Grandad was that his, he told wonderful stories. And I can remember to this day some of Grandad's stories. And I would like to share one with you this morning. Forgive me if I have shared this story before, 
but it is pertinent to our theme today. The story is called Sermon Class, and it concerns a young man named Peter. Peter was a theology student in one of our theological colleges, training for the ministry. And as one has to as a student in theological college, he had to take sermon class. It was his turn to preach the sermon on Sunday morning in chapel, and then afterwards to have that sermon critiqued by his friends and by the staff of the college. So the principal gave Peter a week's notice and said the following Sunday he would be preaching in the chapel. Well, Peter spent the whole week sitting in his study trying to think desperately of something to say in his sermon, and come Sunday morning he had not prepared his sermon. So he walked up into the pulpit and said to the gathered congregation, he said, how many of you know what I'm going to preach about this morning? Well, they just sat there and looked at him because they hadn't a clue. So he said to them, well, neither have I, and he walked out of the pulpit. A little while later, the principal came along to his study and said, well, that wasn't a very good job, was it, Peter? I'll give you another go next Sunday. So again, Peter sat in his study all week, desperately trying to think of something to say, and come Sunday morning, he had not prepared his sermon. So he walked up into the pulpit, and he said again to the congregation, how many of you know what I'm going to preach about this morning? Well, they were all so embarrassed by last week's performance that they all put their hands up. And so he said to them, excellent, in that case I don't need to tell you, do I? And so he walked out of the pulpit. Well, again, the principal came along to his study and said to him, Peter, that was absolutely hopeless. That really wasn't a good performance. I'm going to give you one more chance. Next Sunday you have to produce a sermon for us. And if you don't, I shall have to ask you to leave the college. So Peter sat in his study all week, desperately trying to think of something to say in his sermon on Sunday morning. And come Sunday morning, he hadn't been able to think of a thing. And he walked up into the pulpit in chapel, already having packed his bags. He said to the assembled congregation, how many of you know what I'm going to preach about this morning? Well, this time only half of them put their hands up. So Peter said to them, Okay, excellent. Those of you who do know, tell those who don't. And he walked out of the pulpit. He was already out of his study with his bags when the principal came along. <clears throat> and the principal said to him, Peter, what are you doing? And Peter said, well, I'm, I'm, I didn't do sermon class, I failed, so I've packed my bags and I'm going. Well, the principal said to him, well, I will grant you it was a very, very short sermon, but it was to the point and it was very clear. And he said, and I hope in future all of your sermons will be to the point and so clear. Those of you who do know, tell those who don't. We sing together our next hymn, Colors of Day Dawn Into the Mind, The Day Has Begun, The Night Is Behind. Oh, 
share together in a blessing for our young friends. Almighty and eternal God, we ask for your blessing on all our young friends wherever they are, praying that they will enjoy going back to school and being with their friends again. We pray that you will give them hope, inner peace, and the profound knowledge that they are loved and cared for in all situations. Please keep them safe and wrap your blessing around them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Our second and New Testament reading comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 24, and reading verses 36. To 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broad fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the laws of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. Thank you very much indeed. Our nation, our commonwealth, and our world focused their attention yesterday afternoon on the 30 people who gathered in St. George's Chapel in Windsor to give thanks for the life and work of Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. We joined with them in mourning the loss of one who has been a central part of our national life for over 70 years. With them, we give thanks for his devotion to Elizabeth and his support for her as Queen. We give thanks for his wonderful sense of duty that could see him standing out in the rain only a few years ago at the tender age of 94 to take the salute of young soldiers. We give thanks for his dedication and commitment to young people in particular through the award scheme that bears his name. We give thanks for his passion for wildlife and ecology through his work with the Worldwide Fund for Nature. We give thanks for his strong faith and for his gentle discipleship, providing a rock and stable foundation to the lives not only of his family, but also of so many who looked to him for guidance and encouragement. His witness was one of duty and humble service. And with so many across our nation and across our world, we give thanks to God for the amazing legacy he has left by, by a long life of love and devotion. 
In our resurrection the story, story this morning from St. Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. And to their eternal credit, those disciples took up that challenge and went across the entire Near Eastern world right into the heart of Rome to share their witness. And without their witness, I strongly suspect that you and I would not be worshipping today. Today we are the disciples of Jesus. We are the ones who have chosen to walk his way in the world of our day. And I firmly believe that Jesus offers us the same challenge. We also are witnesses of these things. But of what are we witnesses? Well, in verses 46 and 47 of Luke chapter 24, according to Jesus, we are witnesses of two things. Firstly, we are witnesses to Jesus' passion and resurrection. Well, of course, for us on one level, that is totally impossible. The early disciples were indeed direct witnesses of Jesus' suffering, crucifixion and resurrection. But we are not. Indeed, we must rely on accounts that date at least 40 years from the actual events and accounts that are conflicting and confusing, to say the least. We are not direct witnesses unless we can claim to have had some kind of Damascus Road experience. So to what can we witness? We can, of course, declare our own belief in what happened based on our understanding of the gospel records. But if we are to be witnesses, compelling and attractive witnesses, then we need something more than belief in difficult archives. We need to be able to speak from our own experience. The early disciples could speak powerfully and attractively to the gathered crowds precisely because they drew on personal experience. Our witness will be dull and meaningless unless we can do the same. Our experience is not of Jesus' suffering and resurrection, but rather how Jesus' suffering and resurrection impact upon us. We each of us carry deep and powerful experiences of times when God has intervened in our lives with healing and transforming love. We can each of us recount, quite vividly I suspect, those times in our lives when dreadful and almost unbearable suffering has been transformed into something new and something quite unexpected. These are times when the most inexpressible peace has suddenly taken hold of us in the midst of great upset. These are times when great joy has suddenly flooded into our souls in a time of sadness and loss. These are times when an act of totally unexpected kindness has transformed our wavering faith in human goodness. We all have our own stories and our own real experiences of times when God has acted to transform pain and suffering into new and hopeful life. And it is to this that we can bear witness. Certainly we bear witness to the fact that our God acted once in human history to bring new life in a way that has changed human history forever. However, we also bear witness to the fact that God continues to act in human history. Our God is a loving God who cares for creation and who wills our good. A God who will always transform that which is dark and unpleasant and bring out of it new light and new joy. That is something to which we can bear witness with authority and with conviction. We'll think about our second point in just a moment. For now, we sing together the hymn, Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. Yeah. 
Secondly, according to Jesus, we are witnesses to the realities of repentance and forgiveness. Jesus' whole life and ministry was focused on bringing people back to a living relationship with God. Wherever he saw that people had turned their backs on God or had forgotten the power that God has to change their lives for the better, he was dismayed and upset for them. Jesus' great mission in life was to restore and heal broken relationships with God. Now I am equally sure that each of us has profound and moving memories of those times in our own lives when we, to borrow a phrase, strayed like lost sheep and went along our own paths only then to find a new way back to God and found God waiting for us with open arms. Who of us has not proved for themselves time and again the parable of the prodigal son? We know it to be true. It is a living part of our experience. Repentance and forgiveness are not abstract ideas for us. They are not fodder for philosophical debate or tricky questions for theology exams. They are part of our real experience, part of our spiritual history, and indeed essential building blocks of our spiritual growth. We don't have to be told of the reality of a loving and accepting God. We know it to be true, and it is to this inner healing reality that we are called to bear witness. However, here is the crunch. Jesus said, you are witnesses of these things. The implication is that if we don't bear witness to these realities, who will? If we don't speak in meaningful and compelling ways of the life-changing effect of God's love, then we cannot sit back and blame others if the current generation or the next generation do not know. And we live in a time that is hungry for good news, for something that will change life and give it greater meaning and purpose. How will others hear of that which can redeem their lives and provide them with inner peace and everlasting joy if we who know do not tell them? And of course, not just tell them, 
but show them. God has no hands on earth but our hands. And we know this to be true, but we do have to admit that sometimes we are afraid and indeed ashamed to speak up and to bear witness to that which is for us so profoundly important. Well, the challenge from Jesus is to stop being ashamed and to stop hiding our light under that bowl. As his body today, we are witnesses of these things. Let us pray that we have the courage and the willingness of Isaiah to respond to, to those God-given opportunities for sharing with the life-shaking words, Here am I, send me. We come before our God in a time of prayer and reflection. Let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the great message of Easter, that in the valley of sorrow and suffering, and even in the shadow of death, you are present with us, working out your eternal purposes. We thank you for our own experiences of your resurrection power, for those occasions when we have cried out from the depths of our beings to discover not only that you can lift us up, but also that you were with us in our need, holding our heads above the water and helping us through our experience of adversity to deepen our faith and broaden our understanding. We thank you for the assurance that there is nothing in heaven or on the earth that can ever separate us from your love, that there is no situation, however dreadful it may seem, that is beyond your power to redeem. We thank you that through the changes and challenges of this life, we can always trust in your purposes, knowing that we shall always be in the light of your presence. Almighty and eternal God, as we offer you our thanks, we also offer you our gifts, our resources, our interests and talents, all that we are and all that we have, offering all in the service of your kingdom. Eternal God, we know that if we are to respond to your commission to be your witnesses in all situations, then it is likely to be a painful business, especially when you ask more of us than we feel able to give. We reach out in love and concern for all those who need nourishment and support. We think of those reeling from the termination of their employment or the breakdown of an important relationship, or eviction from their home. We think of those who are struggling to make ends meet, those who are drowning under the burden of debt. May they find the strength and support they need from you and from us. We pray for those who are having to come to terms with unfulfilled ambitions, those who have been let down by broken promises or overcome by sudden catastrophe. We think of those struggling with illness, those who are close to death, and those who cannot wait to die. We think of those who are bearing the pain of the loss of a loved one. May they find the strength and support they need from you and from us. Eternal God, our rock and our redeemer, we give you thanks for the life and work of your servant, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. We thank you for his long life, for his devoted support of Elizabeth in her vocation as queen, and for his service to our commonwealth and to our nation. 
We thank you for the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, for the work of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, and for so many other causes that he inspired and supported. We rejoice that he lived and shared the faith that is so important to us, and that he made his discipleship real through dedicated and humble service. We pray for those who will miss Philip most deeply, Elizabeth and all the royal family, that they may find comfort and hope in the knowledge of your Easter triumph. Eternal God, we think too of ourselves and our constant need to nourish and renew ourselves. Please show us those areas in our lives where it is time to make a change, to stop chasing activities that are no longer appropriate, and to let go of dreams that are no longer viable. Please give us the wisdom to know when it is necessary to accept change, and even to welcome it as a friend. Please help us to recognize our need to nourish and strengthen ourselves by spending meaningful time with you, and by doing those things that nurture and feed our souls. Eternal God, remind us always of our Easter faith, that from endings come new beginnings, that from death comes new life. And may we always have the confidence to share that with a troubled world. Help us to trust that you take our hands into the unknown. We offer to you our prayers, knowing that it is impossible to pray honestly and for nothing to happen. And to you, eternal God, be all honor, praise and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. We conclude our worship as we sing together our final hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise.
may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.